of her eyes, says Jesus, Take your time. has changed my whole life. If anybody ask you, oh, yeah. just who I am, will you tell them that I am redeemed? defense and to make sure that you're justified 
You don't want just anybody defending you. Okay. It'd be very difficult for you to stand in the face of the judge, particularly when you're guilty, and give a defense for yourself. A lot of times you don't know enough about the law, and uh, there's things that you've done, transgressions that have happened, and you need a good, solid defense. And you don't want just anybody defending you. You want somebody who knows the law, ins and outs, who knows the fine print, somebody who's going to be committed, dedicated to your cause, knows how to speak to the judge, and somebody who all out cares about your cause, and somebody who's capable of making your case. It'd be very hard for you to make a case for yourself because you're guilty, and because there are certain things you've done that are worthy of punishment. And possibly the sentence that the judge would give would be one that you deserve and one that has to happen because there's been a violation. But yet, there needs to be a defense as to what probably motivated it, probably what maybe have happened altogether, and possibly to lighten up the punishment if not remove it altogether. And so you need a defender. You need somebody to stand in the gap. You need somebody who's worthy and capable of doing just that. And that's not somebody you're going to look for that doesn't care, that is a novice, somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, they don't know the law, they can't make a case for themselves, let alone make a case for you. And that's not something you want to commit your time and money to. You want someone who's going to be totally, absolutely responsible and committed to your case. In fact, there ought to be a sort of a credit report and something you can trace to show that they've done it for somebody else and because they've done it for others at a great success rate that they can do it for you. And so this individual who's going to act as a lawyer to stand for you ought to be very reliable and they ought to be very credible. And there are people who pay thousands and thousands of dollars to get people to defend their cases and yes, they may win them. But when it comes down to life, the bottom line is you and I still have to make a case for ourselves because there are certain things that we still do owe. As a matter of fact, you're born in the negative. You're born headed for punishment. And although you might beat a traffic ticket, you might beat a domestic, you might get around some kind of civil violation, you still owe where your soul and sin is concerned. And many people may even get people to lie on their behalf, do things that are twisted where the law is concerned on their behalf. And if the truth be told, there are many even public defenders and lawyers that work together for money's sake to get people off. And so justice is not really truly served. And so although you may have gotten around the court system, you didn't get around God's system. God is the one who is the head. He sees all. He's in full authority, and he's the ultimate judge. And so according to him, his law and righteousness and his high standards, everybody is born in sin and headed and worthy of punishment. Amen. And so with that, also, God is one who loves, and God is one who's just. Amen. And so with that commitment and with that responsibility, God takes it upon himself to offer relief from that penalty. With that, there has to be the not only a good, but the best lawyer to convince God on the behalf of the, of the offender. There has to be a great defender, one who is capable of speaking totally for the one who is guilty of the sin and completely wiping it away and justifying them altogether. Well, you're not going to be able to call some firm somewhere with three or four people together in a corporation and get it done. No matter what their track record is, no matter how much money you pay, they're not going to be able to deal with the sin that you have to give an account for. There's no lawyer that's going to be able to stand for you where God is concerned, except for one. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is our great lawyer. As a matter of fact, as the Bible says, what we're going to look at in a moment, is that he's our great mediator. He is our great, that is the great mediator. Meaning that he is a dispute settler. He's one who can and will stand in the gap. And he's one who can relieve the dispute between an individual and God. Because yes, 
You're born, I'm born, everybody is born in variance against God. Born guilty of sin where a holy and righteous God is concerned and in need of mediation. You may not think you need mediation, but when it comes down to sin, the truth be told, you need somebody to stand in the gap. And that's not something you want to discover the reality of when you die, when you have to give an account for all your sins and you don't have enough. You want to make sure that you have a justifier, which can't be you, can't be your parents, can't be your siblings, can't be your spouse, because they don't have enough. They don't have enough reliability. They don't have enough credibility. They don't, listen, you can't pay them enough money to stand in the gap. It has to be one who is accepted by the great judge, that is God, to stand on your behalf and plead your case for you completely and justify you before himself. And so that one, we know, as born-again believers, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to work on in this part of our series where we're dealing with making the Jesus case. Making the Jesus case that is an apologetic form and stance and testimony for speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. There are all kinds of lies, all kinds of accusations, and all kinds of testimonies against Christ. But we know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And so with our lives, we have to make a case for the Lord Jesus Christ. But the problem is, you and I haven't been guilty. We have to make a case that Jesus Christ is worthy to be made a case for, number one, and that he is capable of making a case for us. Because he does have to make a case for us. Otherwise, we're still in sin, owing every single bit of penalty uh, that's required. And so you and I in our lives are on the witness stand continually, having to testify and witness about who Jesus is before a world that constantly accuses him. Yeah. Before this court system that's on the platform of this world, with a system that's anti-Christ, that speaks against Christ, you and I have to constantly stand with a testimony to prove that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be. And he's done the work that he said he was going to do, and he's going to continue to do the work that he said he's going to do. In fact, we declare that he's all-sufficient, he's number one, and he's in full authority. That's the case that you and I make for Christ repeatedly. The same time, Jesus Christ has and will continue to make a case for us. Why? Because there are accusations against us continually. Where do we stand? Who do we know? Is Jesus Christ real? Will we continue to be committed? Will we continue to be reliable? Will we continue to stand on Jesus? Just who is this Jesus? That's one thing that the world says. It's always opposition. As a matter of fact, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Constantly trying to accuse God uh, before us. Constantly trying to accuse each other. Uh, before God, and so we have to make a case for the Lord Jesus Christ. But one thing many probably never think about is the fact that at one time, before we were saved, that Jesus, that God himself, had a case against us. Amen. As a matter of fact, he had a problem with every single thing and every single part of our being. Yeah. And we were born in sin, and sin can't stand in the presence of a holy God. Amen. So with that, there's a variance between the human being and God, and there's a case that needs to be made, and there's justification that needs to take place immediately. And it has to happen before death occurs, and it has to be worthy. Well, how could God be angry with me? He's all loving. Uh, he's a good God. He's a loving God, but I'll tell you, he's a just God who won't tolerate sin. And so since the human being is born in sin, not one single person can stand before God and can't have eternal life and righteousness where God is concerned with sin baggage on your account. Being born in the negative and stand that way without justification. And so therefore, there's variance, there's contention, and there's a problem where the human being is concerned, where mankind is concerned, and where God is concerned. But that doesn't say that that can't get fixed. It can only get fixed with one who stands in the gap, one who stands in the middle, and settles the dispute. And so, just what is this dispute uh, that God has with man? Of course, it has to deal with sin. Uh, sin separates us from God. It simply is all unrighteousness. We know that God is holy, so anything else can't stand before God. 
And so the problem that God has is with the uh, sin, the unfaithfulness, the disobedience, the rebellion, and the wickedness of man. That every single person is born in and remains in without Christ. And so that is the case. That is the problem. Those are the penalties and those are the standards that God has against man. And so every single person needs to seek mediation, has to have a defense. Now, yes, we're born in sin. We have sin, been disobedient, done certain things aside from God, been a part of the world system. And so there needs to be a defense, not excuses for why you did this and that and the other. Not kind of smoothing it over, but a defense that's going to, listen, eliminate and cover the sin completely. Deal with it where as though you don't owe the penalty, whereby it's paid for. Now, I can tell you of a surety, you might find a good man, you might find a good woman who can get up and plead your case, and uh, they can say a lot of things according to the law. They can somewhat justify you. They can reduce the payment you have to pay. They can possibly keep you from going to jail or reduce the sentences somehow and confess the judge one way or another. And uh, they might get you over. As a matter of fact, the case might get settled. And so somebody might say, well, that's enough. I got my good lawyer. That's all I need. But I can guarantee you there's not one lawyer, not one firm, not one place you can go to where that lawyer will die for your case. Amen. will die and give his or her life on your behalf. They won't shed a drop of blood to get you off. You might pay them a lot of money. They might go through a lot of cases, do a lot of things. It might drag on. They might get you off. It might take time. They might read documents. They might go through all the things they have to go through, and they might get before the judge. Some may even be willing to look or sound like a fool on your behalf. But not one of them is going to die for your case. And so where God is concerned, listen, there has to be a death. Because not one single good work that you and I can put before God will justify us before him. You and I can't say, well, I've done this good over here and I've done this and that over there. And we can give God a list and God will somehow accept it. Yes, it might be a mighty good extensive list of good deeds and good things. But yet, it's not enough to deal with the complete sin debt. The debt is just too high. It's too much, listen, it's too big of a price to be paid, and none of your good works, none of the bad things that you don't do, nobody else covering you, no amount of money will get you off and out of the debt that you and I owe. Yeah. The only thing that it's going to take is a bloodshed, the only thing that's going to take is death. Well, somebody says, well, what about my bloodshed? And uh, all my blood, sweat, and tears, and all the work that I did, it's just not enough. Well, what about the price that I paid? It's not enough. What about how hard I work? It's not going to amount to what it is that the price is that has to be paid. In fact, all of our sin requires our lives completely. It requires a death. Now, let's just say uh, you could die and uh, God would somehow say your death is the thing that is required and uh, you die and that's it. Well, your bloodshed is not pure enough. It's not enough to measure up. In fact, you'll die, and uh, because of the penalty on sin, you won't rise again, and your life won't matter not one single bit. That'll be eternal damnation forever. Amen. There has to be the purest bloodshed possible. There has to be the holiest life given as a sacrifice possible to complete the death. Yeah. And there has to be the power of a resurrection and the promise of eternal life. Not one single person can get that done in and of themselves. No group, no corporation can get it done. No representative can get it done at all. There has to be a complete, watch this, a complete and perfect mediator. Amen. With a death from a life that's worthy enough to sacrifice, with blood that was shed, with the work that's complete enough to satisfy God's righteous judgment upon man. No man can do it in and of themselves. No woman can do it in and of themselves. No group can do it in and of themselves. But yet, it can be done. Amen. And it has been done. It's been executed by God himself, emptying himself into the great mediator, the great man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why he, listen, he is our great, all-powerful, all-worthy, authoritative mediator. Yes, He's the one that you and I go to. 
He's the one that you and I call on. He's the one that is our great and greatest defense. He can cover every single thing uh, that you and I have done, that you and I can think, and that you and I will do. Now, that doesn't give you a license to go out and sin all over the place, but what it does is it gives you coverage based on repentance and a life who by faith and obedience is submitted completely to him. You get coverage by the great mediator. And I can tell you he's the one who has never lost a case, quite capable of defending any case or whatever you're guilty of, whatever you come in with, no matter how much of a mess has been made, he's capable of covering it because his blood is acceptable. His life is acceptable and it's the very thing that God will look at and accept as being coverage for the life uh, of the sinner. And so that's what I want to look at very briefly in this part of this message and this series is Jesus, our great mediator. That is, he's the one that settles all of our disputes. Not only does he settle the disputes, but he lays out workable, watch this, workable settlements. And so it's not this fine print in there of ifs and do's and don'ts and if this don't happen and this clause and all these kind of catches and stuff. Listen, he works out a settlement that settles the dispute. The dispute, the conflict, the contention is settled completely. So that means if I'm in Christ, God's not still mad. Or God's not angry. There's no longer a separation. There's no longer miles and miles and light years, in fact, an eternity between me and God. Yeah. That settles it. I believe Jesus, he did the work on the cross for it. He set up the terms and conditions of a new covenant. It was by his bloodshed. God accepts it. I'm now justified and I'm in the family of God completely. Amen. To be taken, plucked out, separated, no more. <laughs> I'm completely uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the family of God because of my great mediator, because of this new covenant, this new contract, this new agreement that God himself drew up the terms and conditions and that Jesus Christ settled based on his death. Yeah. Basically, what the case says in the courtroom is this. You were a sinner, you did owe, uh, your crimes were punishable under the law, but now through Jesus Christ and his death and his bloodshed, now you're paid in full. You're now redeemed. The ransom has been paid. The penalty and the punishment has been lifted based on what not all your works accomplished, not what all you're not doing certain things got done, but what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And now listen, your relationship to him. Yeah. Being that he's your great lawyer, he's your great defender, you're in him. God sees the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees that you've got now blood coverage with Jesus, so that settles the case. So now there's no longer a case against you. That's what you and I have to put in a package on the witness stand. And that what we show the world is that there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who don't live their life after the flesh, but according to the spirit of God. Now I'm justified in the Lord Jesus Christ. And my life shows it. My walk will declare it. And uh, everything will confirm that I'm now in Christ and there's no longer a penalty and a punishment against me. And so that's one of the main biggest proofs when we're making a case for the Lord Jesus Christ is that now the punishment has been lifted. Uh, the debt has been paid in full. I've got a clear conscience. I'm going to tell you what it does. The blood of Jesus Christ, the promise of the Holy Spirit now comes in and purges me from dead works. So now all the things that I did according to the old identity, the old thing that I was, and the old mindset that I had, I know not now no longer do it. And I do them based on what I've got as far as the gift of the Holy Spirit and the blood coverage that I have right now and my account that now is full of Jesus Christ. Amen. And full of all the fruit of the Spirit and all the things that I'm now established based on my brand new identity. That's the case for Christ, is that he settled it. I've got the biggest, best, greatest, most authoritative, most complete lawyer. He took it, got it all done. As a matter of fact, he's continuing to get it all done. He died for me. Yes. He wasn't some smooth talking, slick lawyer who could outwit the judge. Listen, he got it all done. Yes. He paid the price. Yes. Victory was won on the cross. And so now I get behind him and he's my lawyer forever. He's the mediator forever. He said the dispute is only one contract. I don't have to renew anything. I don't have to pay any premium. It's all done completely. And that covenant, all those terms, all those conditions have affected my life completely. In fact, I'm living according to this new contract that I've got. I'm living according to this new covenant that I've got. And listen, 
That doesn't just stay in your file cabinet somewhere. That doesn't just stay tucked away in a safe somewhere. It's in your heart. And you live it out. You live your life based on the fact that you've got a mediator. You live your life based on the fact that now you're good with God. You're in right standing with God based on the Lord Jesus Christ. That affects your mindset. It affects your life. It affects every single thing that you do. In fact, you're not going to go back in that courtroom all over again with those same charges against you. That's it. There's no case again. So the proof is right there. That, listen, Satan may accuse. He may say all kinds of things. He may write all kinds of tickets. He may give all kinds of accusations, but it doesn't stand. God throws it out before it even gets there. Because Jesus Christ took it, listen, he took it on himself on the cross. And so people may make their complaints, Satan may make their complaints, but you don't have to give in to those complaints and things like that and follow all kinds of other things. Why? Because Jesus Christ took care of it. You don't have to stand on that stand again at all. Because it was done once and for all completely. That case was settled when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. You got baptized, you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the only court case that will ever exist. The next thing is really to go before God to receive your rewards and judgment. That's the only other thing you'll see where the great judge is concerned. Never to go back again. But yet you've got sinners over and over again, go back over and over again, not living their lives settled because the case where God is concerned is not settled at all. Yeah. And so with that, I'm glad that there's no amount of good works that I just have to do to earn it. Good works are done because of what he did. And the Lord Jesus Christ on the inside of my life, the Holy Spirit living on the inside of my life. Now my life is in with Christ and God. Yeah. Now I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now the Holy Spirit flows through my life and the evidence is very clear. And so when people say that this is that and the other, you didn't do this, that and the other, based on the fruit of the Spirit, listen, God will continue to advocate the case. The Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, will continue to speak for you. When was the last time you had what seemed like one of these good lies against you? And uh, Satan accused you of certain things and said you weren't this, weren't that, wasn't measuring up to this and that and the other. It seemed like you had a whole committee against you. And it seemed like it was clear and convincing. But God, listen, but God right in the nick of time stepped in and stood and pleaded your case and spoke it in such a way where everybody that needed to hear it everybody that needed to see it saw it and it was very clear that God on your side and that God is the one that was speaking for you no matter what case they brought up against you what they said against you you were in Christ so God spoke for you you don't have that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ He'll always plead your case. In fact, he'll say, you know what? You can say what you want, and uh, you can bring up all these charges, put them in my face. Matter of fact, get them out of my face because that's my child. <laughs> you say what they did and didn't do, but this is who they are. In fact, as a matter of fact, even if they did do something, I can say it like this. They're a work in progress. They're my child. I'm working with them. And I've got them. So they behind me. And they want to deal with anything they deal with me because I'm in charge of their life. You're not their judge. I am. And if I say they're cleansed, if I say they're forgiven, if I say they're justified, if I say they're covered, if I say they're in right standing with me, then they are. If I say they don't get punished, if I say they don't go to jail, then they won't. If I say that they don't owe, then they don't owe. Why? Because they're in me. Because Jesus Christ is my great mediator. And that's something that you and I need to know when we're facing charges, when we're facing condemnation, when we're facing opposition. You need to remember that Jesus Christ is the great mediator and that he's your personal mediator. That is, he already has spoken for you, died for you, done the work that was needed that you couldn't do for yourself completely, giving you salvation. Now listen, he can deal with anything else that comes your way, short of eternal death. He took care of your sin debt, so he can take care of everything else. And yes, you might owe certain things. You may have crossed certain lines and done certain things. He can bring you back. And he can straighten it out. You just get behind him. Why? Because he speaks for you. He's your mediator. And so when people try to bring up your past, listen, you remind them of your future, of who you are right now. You're not what you were, but this is something different right now. So Satan will always try to dig up your past. Yeah. He's looking at your progress right now in the present. He goes and gets your past and try to bring it up to the present. Well, it doesn't have to dominate or even predict for that matter your future. Because your future is in Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one that says, oh, yes, he or she did that and all those things like that. But listen, it's covered under the blood. Yes. 
and it's washed away in the sea of forgetfulness. It's down the garbage disposal. Listen, I've never put anything in the garbage disposal and pulled it back out. I've never taken out my trash on Tuesday morning and things like that and gotten it back on Friday. Once I put it there, it's gone. Once I flush something, it's down. It's not coming back up. Well, that's how sin is dealt with by God and how the work of Jesus Christ deals with sin. And all those things in the past. Listen, when he says it's washed away in the sea of forgetfulness, it's gone. But yet you have those that keep bringing it back up. But listen, the work that the Holy Spirit does in your life, the work that Jesus Christ does in your life as the great mediator will be something that will wipe away all of those mistakes. God will have you to do something now that greatly outweighs whatever was done before. And even in the lives of others, even if it was a big thing or whatever, it looked very small and way short of all the things that the Holy Spirit empowers you to do right now. And think about all the things that you're going to do. So why are you stuck in the past? Listen, you don't have to be stuck in the past because that case is over. It's already done. And victory was already won because Jesus Christ is our great mediator. So with that, take your Bible, if you will. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 9, just a few verses. We don't have a lot of time. We're going to get there. But first, I want you to go to 1 Timothy and uh, chapter 2. And what you're going to see is the Apostle Paul, like we're going to see in Hebrews, like we've been dealing with this series. And uh, you're going to see where Paul is giving some very clear-cut instructions to young Timothy, who is in the pastorate. In fact, he's been a good protege of Paul, and Paul has given him a lot of instructions. And so now Paul is on sort of the tail end of his ministry, which was a great ministry that we're still benefiting from right here and right now by the grace of God. And so he's given some instructions to this young pastor and what to do where setting up church is concerned. And so Timothy needed to know about structure and order and how to get everything done. And uh, Paul knew that he would face some opposition, which he did. And uh, he would face some persecution, which he had by those uh, false teachers and those Judaizers and things like that. were nothing about themselves. Wasn't really teaching about Jesus. They were pushing the law and all that kind of stuff and for their own benefits and their own personal gain. So uh, Paul wanted to make sure that Timothy didn't get overwhelmed and discouraged, even to the point of kind of backing up out of the ministry. Definitely he didn't want them uh, blending in with those things. And so Paul gave uh, Timothy a couple of letters which really laid down everything that needed to be done where the church was concerned. Because you had going forward the building of the uh, church and the body of Christ, of course, and the kingdom of God on earth uh, through the church. And so Paul, under the inspiration of God, wanted to make sure that order was set. And so Timothy, having a heart for God and really serving uh, where Paul was concerned and being dedicated, being committed, need to know these things. And so Paul gives him uh, quite a bit of really good instructions. And so in his first uh, letter for, or epistle to Timothy, Paul is giving him some very valuable instructions. So look at uh, chapter 2. Of course, we don't have time to go through every one of them, but I want to look at this one in particular for the sake of this context that we're working on today. And Paul is telling Timothy to pray for all men. So the basis of every single thing that Paul uh, tells Timothy is going to be prayer, talking to God, communicating with God. Listen, you can't do any ministry, anything at all, without prayer. Nothing's going to be done effectively without prayer. You're going to have to consult God. You may get a lot of advice from a lot of different people, but God is the ultimate authority. In fact, God is the ultimate source. And so Paul is making sure that uh, Timothy knows his source and uh, that he translates that to the parishioners that they know who their source is because it's real easy to get off track and get involved in materialism and uh, get overwhelmed by opposition and things like that. And so Paul wanted to make sure that Timothy's focus was in the right direction and he wanted to make sure that the parishioners' focus and the church was in the right direction. So look at what uh, the Apostle Paul says, chapter 2 in 1 Timothy. He says, Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Look at what he lays down first. And uh, he's really trying to drive this home to make sure that intercession and prayers is done. That is, on the pastor's behalf for the people, people for each other, and that uh, constant communication with God is done. And uh, he goes on to uh, make it clear that it's not just for all those around you, but it's for even governments as well, because it all runs the risk of getting away from God. So he goes on to say, uh, giving of thanks, be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, 
that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Now that peace and uh, all that is only going to come from a relationship with God and a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what he goes on to make very clear in verse 3. He says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And look at what he says next uh, in verse 5. He says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. He's making that very clear. And so uh, I like how he does this because he clears up all this stuff about praying to this one, praying to that one, praying to the other one. It's not this big buffet of kind of cosmic gods that you just take your pick and pray for and it's going to intervene in the affairs of men. In fact, like we talked about last week, you go to pray and all this other stuff and all these other mystic things and all like that, you're going to wind up tapping into the devil, getting under the authority of Satan. He says there's only one God and one mediator between God and man. So you're talking about connecting with God and staying connected with God. That's only going to come through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's not get this thing twisted about who to pray to and who to pray for and how to pray. Jesus made it very clear how to pray. He laid down the structure in the Lord's prayer. He spoke about it. And see, he's the one that connects us. Listen, he's the great intercessor and mediator that connects us to God. And so let's get it settled right now who to pray through. Pray to God and pray through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, uh, for this is good acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and comes to knowledge of the truth. That's the will of God. He says, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. That is, God in the flesh, recognizing that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Every spirit that uh, is of God will recognize and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. There's no sense in praying if you don't accept the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't accept the fact and the truth that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, there's no sense in praying. Because your belief system is warped. Uh, you don't know the truth, and so knowing the man, Jesus Christ, is how you and I come in right relationship with God. And Paul makes that clear. And he goes on to say this. He says, who gave himself a ransom for all. So that's the payment that had to be paid where God was concerned. There's the debt. There's what was owed. That's what was cleared up. That's what took care of the account. Who? Yeah. The Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's no sense in praying to somebody else and all these things that people come up with and all that thing like that. It's coming through the Lord Jesus Christ who did what? Gave his life a ransom. Amen. Who gave his life a sacrifice. Who offered redemption. It's through him that you and I get saved. It's through him and I, listen, it's through him that you and I have right standing with God. Amen. And so he says, who gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That is, that testimony stands complete. That testimony stands forever. Yeah. And the reaping all together of that where eternal life is concerned is going to be totally in full. It was done on the cross, but that complete cash in will be at the day of redemption uh, when you and I come into the kingdom. So that means that lasts forever. That's eternal. It's not something that's going to cover a payment for a year or two years, five years, and that's it. It's not some little lease that you just take out somewhere. That's not what the ransom of God does through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. It takes care of the debt forever. Yeah. It takes care of the punishment for an eternity. So he says to be testified in due time for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. He says, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. I don't have time to go all into it, but what the Apostle Paul is doing now, too, like he always does, he, uh, he, listen, he's defending his apostleship. And he's defending his apostleship by his conversion, what he used to be, and what he is now. And one of the least likely people to be used by God was the Apostle Paul. And you look back at his story and uh, his stance and the things that he was doing, he would seem like the last person that God would call to do anything. But yet he was called to do this great thing, and that is minister uh, to the Gentiles and present the kingdom of God to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. You're talking about somebody who was dead set against believers. Somebody who was steeped in the law and the sacrificial system and all kinds of legalities and all those kinds of things. It was Paul. Uh, but he was knocked down and commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ, turned around, and uh, his spiritual eyes were open, and look at what he's accomplished. 
and look at what things he's done. And now he's at the end of it with this great, solid testimony about the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, clear, convincing evidence of what God will do. It's in the Apostle Paul. And so he's defending his apostleship. He says, I'm a preacher and speaking the truth in Christ. He's not justifying himself. He says, in Christ. So there's a case right there. Paul, who was in a legal system, Paul, who was in the Sanhedrin, uh, in the courtroom, bringing cases against believers, uh, carrying out execution, uh, persecutions and things like that against believers. Now, he's speaking on behalf of Christ. Amen. Speaking on behalf of believers. Now, that get done? Uh, that get, listen, that didn't get done in of his own will. That's not the will of man. That's a miracle from God. Amen. Look at the case he makes. And it's the same one that you and I can make. Look at what I was and look at what I have now. This is only God. Amen. I mean, I know your story, but I guarantee it's a great one. Amen. I guarantee it's one that you didn't do yourself. Amen. I guarantee it's one that somebody else didn't conjure up. It's God that brought you from where you were to where you are right now. Amen. And it's God is the one that's going to take you to where you're going. Amen. And I guarantee, I hope that you're convinced Amen. that it was God that brought you from darkness to light. Amen. And it's God that's going to carry out his promise that he's made to you now and forever. Amen. This is the work of the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Which in, in this case, uh, where the law was concerned, Gentiles was something that uh, the Jewish people wouldn't deal with at all. So now, here's the Apostle Paul ministering to the Gentiles. The most forbidden thing to the Jews. He's now got a missionary calling and uh, absolute commission by God to carry out the gospel of the kingdom to the Gentiles. Amen. Listen, that's only God. But that's the Apostle Paul's testimony. And you and I will have the same kind of thing and do the same kind of great works uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Briefly, just give me about five minutes. Take your Bible, if you will. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 9, uh, where we left off and look at verse 11. And what you're going to see is, of course, uh, the Apostle Paul speaking about a better everything. All the things that you were used to before, uh, here Jesus Christ, he's just better than everything. That is, he's above everything. Might be some good things, but Jesus Christ is better. Amen. Certain other things may go to a certain point, but it gets to a point and stops, and that's it. In fact, anything that you experience, that's why the uh, Apostle Paul laid out earlier in these chapters, uh, that Jesus Christ is better than everything. He's above all things. So therefore, you might experience some good things because this is God's creation. But don't worship the creation. Worship the creator. Amen. All these other things is going to tap you into stuff that's going to fall way short of what you need for joy. True joy and happiness. Definitely salvation. So don't go worshiping the stars and the trees and the moon and the sun and buildings and the floor and, and all that kind of stuff. Listen, worship God. Amen. Don't sit down, cross your legs, fold your arms, and hum somewhere and look up. You're going to wind up tapping and getting sensitive to the devil. Yeah, yeah. And Satan's going to infuse right into your spirit and make you a devil if you ain't careful. Worship God. Amen. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. He's better. And in this case, within this context, he's saying that uh, Jesus Christ is a better sacrifice. And so all the things that you were used to in the old covenant, the old agreement, the old contract, Jesus Christ is better. Why? Because that was made to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. Show you your sinful state. It was a temporary thing that was done for a temporary atonement, a temporary covenant. But listen, you're in need of a permanent atonement, a permanent covering. The lambs or rams, lambs, bulls and goats and all that kind of stuff wasn't going to be enough. The old tabernacle, the old system, the old legal system wasn't going to be enough. The old things that were done within the old court system wasn't going to be enough. It's just going to be temporary. You need something that's going to be complete. So it was all designed to speak about the completeness in the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything in the legal system, everything in the tabernacle, everything where the sacrificial system is concerned speaks about the ultimate sacrifice in Jesus Christ. All the bloodshed there, although it was pure uh, from the animals, it still wasn't enough. Amen. Definitely no man's blood was pure enough, but it was only temporary. Yeah. But the blood of the lamb was permanent. Amen. That's right. The ultimate sacrifice yeah. in the Lord Jesus Christ would be, thing, listen, a thing that would be done, not over and over again, but a thing that would be done one time and one time only to satisfy the sin debt that you have completely for mankind, for all that would repent and believe it. That would justify every believer completely. Not once a year, not over and over again, but completely and permanently. So Paul says in Hebrews in a nutshell that listen, 
Jesus Christ is better than all the sacrificial system. And so the reason why they were looking at the sacrificial system because they were some new converts and they had come to Christ, but they were under some opposition and persecution from Rome. And Rome pretty much said that, you know what, you can believe whatever you want to believe. You can have a whole buffet of pagan worship idols and whatever you come up with, that's fine, just as long as you know that Caesar is the head. And uh, as long as you know that Rome is in charge. So that's where you get that term from, all roads lead to Rome. You can do whatever you want. You can be in good standing with Rome. As long as you recognize that Rome is in charge. So you can have your belief system, you can have your gods, you can worship your way, you can have your temples, you can have your tabernacles, but just know that Rome is in complete authority. Well, if uh, Jesus has believers, of course, and Jesus is talking about the kingdom, the government of God, universal and on earth, and these believers are talking about this great governor and the Lord Jesus Christ, Rome has a problem with that. Amen. Because now you're not talking about a religion, you're talking about a government, you're talking about a relationship. So now that becomes an issue. So now that invites persecution because Rome is not going to be in competition with any other governor. And so these believers are looking at the great governor in the Lord Jesus Christ. So believers testify, uh, even like in, in its legal terms, where the testimony of a believer basically says that I'm under a brand new government. Yes. The old government is gone. I'm under a new legislature a new judicial system, and that's God, and that's Jesus Christ. So he's my lawyer, he's my mediator. So Rome is like, whoa, wait a minute now, who's this lawyer are you talking about? Who's this judge you're talking about? Who's this governor you're talking about? We deal with Caesar, and we've got all these other ones that do their pagan worship and stuff like that, but they're not talking about governments. They're not talking about authorities. They're not talking about lawyers. Where you come from with this lawyer stuff? Where you come from with this mediation stuff and this government, this kingdom you're talking about? That raises some flags. In fact, that brings about a penalty. So what you had was these brand new believers who believed in Jesus Christ, who talking about a government, now are in competition with Caesar. Amen. Now they're in competition with Rome, which invites persecution from Rome. So with that persecution, these now new believers were looking at these two governments, and they were kind of making a decision. They say, well, now I'm following the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my great governor. And uh, he's my authority now, and he's my mediator. He's covering me, but now I'm finding myself in trouble with Rome. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus Christ is in heaven. He's my mediator. He's in charge, and I believe him, but I'm looking Rome in the face. And I'm looking at this opposition. In fact, in fact I'm about to die. Mm -hmm. And so I got a choice to make. And so a lot of them have started to kind of back up. And they said to themselves, well, you know what? The old covenant, the old way, and Moses and the old judicial system and the old court system and the old sacrificial system. We were all right as long as we did that. So maybe we ought to back up to that. That'll keep us cool with Rome. But Paul is saying, no, go on with Christ because he's above Rome. Amen. He's in charge. Listen, Jesus Christ is in charge. The brand new contract, the brand new government, the brand new judicial system, the brand new legislature, that's who you stick with because that's who's going to represent you no matter what you come up against. Amen. So yes, Rome may do a certain thing, but God got you. Yeah, Rome may do this, that, and the other. They may be out persecuting you and things like that, but you call Jesus. <laughs> and we're going to sit down and deal with this thing. And I'm going to plead your case. And I'm going to deal with you. Almost, listen, all the way to the extent that even if you die, you still got eternal life in me completely. And you will live forever. I died, and even if you die for it, you die for my cause. Amen. You die for my sake, you die in me. And because I rose again, you will rise again. Amen. Rome is not going to rise again. They're just going to die because they're not good with me. I can't defend them. They don't know me. You do. Yeah. So you in, listen, you in charge, and you got authority in me either way. You get in their court system, you get before their magistrate, you get before their judge, you stand on me. I'm above their judges. Even if they kill you, I'm still judge above them. Amen. And I got you covered in every single way. So that's why the Apostle Paul, throughout this uh, letter, this epistle of Hebrews, drives this home uh, to these Jews. And uh, he makes it clear to them to stand on the Lord Jesus Christ and make sure that you know who I am. Let me read this very briefly. I only got a couple minutes left. Look at verse 11. In chapter 9, and what you're going to see where Jesus is our heavenly sanctuary. That is, he's better than this tabernacle, things that men may put together. And he's showing them, listen, he's showing them 
that Jesus is better than what your hands made. He's better than the tabernacle, the temple, the mosaic system, and all those kinds of things that you might come up with and want to backtrack to. He's better uh, than that. In fact, he's got better promises, and uh, you stand with him, and uh, you stand on him. He's going to bring about promises that all those things couldn't necessarily promise. In fact, those things back in the old forecasts, and they were a theological term as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means a uh, Old Testament prefigurement of something to come in the New Testament. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't make sense to be stuck back there because all that spoke about or foreshadowed the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're safe in Christ. So look at what the Apostle Paul says in verse 11. He says, but Christ came as high priest of good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation not with the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption for if the blood of bulls and goats and of ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh how much more watch this how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is not just an exterior thing. This is an interior thing. Amen. He says, and for, watch this, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So that's permanent. That's the work that he has done. That's the work that is completely done. That is, your conscience, your heart has been cleansed and been purged. No outer disinfectant of blood or anything else can get that done. Amen. You and I walk around with a clear conscience that has been purged by the blood of Jesus and gives us a brand new heart and a brand new mind. Unbeliever can't say that. Somebody in another religion can't say that. Nothing stands in the gap for anything else in any other religion. I'm not disrespecting nobody, I'm telling the truth. When it comes down to Jesus, he did the thing that was complete for your heart, Amen. complete for your soul. Yes. Settle every single area. Yes. Do all the settlements that were needed. Filled in all the gaps. There's not one single void that you have in your soul. Amen. Your conscience is clear. And the believer can truly testify that Jesus Christ is my all in all. Yes. And he's taking care of every single one of my needs. Yes. I haven't heard that any other religion or any other cult for that matter to say that something or somebody stood in the gap and died and did what, some kind of fiction or something like that. But this is truth. Amen. And the evidence is my heart and my mind and my walk and all the things that have been done through the Lord Jesus Christ and the inheritance that we receive. Verse 16 says, For where there is a testament or an agreement or covenant, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. That is, the one who's going to set the terms and conditions for that covenant, the one who's going to make that thing effective, the one that's going to complete it, listen, there's going to have to be a death. And a complete death. And so if you and I as believers are going to have eternal life, there's going to have to be the death. There's going to have to be one beyond ours to satisfy the death. That is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God hath commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. We we'll have to stop it right there. He says there is no remission. That is no no complete forgiveness. There's no eradication, and with that, there's still guilt. There's still shame. They're not a complete purging. It's an incomplete work. But when it comes down to the blood of Jesus that was shed for the believer, there's a completeness. 
and the evidence of that completeness is in your life. And the progression is in all the things that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. The finished work that was needed was done on the cross. But now you're made brand new through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I can show and make a clear and convincing case. I hope you can too. That Jesus Christ is real. Jesus Christ is in charge. And he is my great mediator. consider whether you know the Lord Jesus Christ or not whether your soul is saved you need to think about your soul maybe you've never given it a lot of thought you thought about your body you thought about your residence but you never thought about your soul well that's the most important thing because that's what's going to live forever when your body dies when something happens to your residence something happens to your vehicle something happens to whatever, another person, whatever the case may be, your soul goes on forever. But the biggest question is, where is your soul going to be spent? Amen. Who is going to be in charge of your soul? That's what's going to determine where you spend eternity. Your soul is your mind, your will, your determination, decision making, the essence of you, the real you, the part you don't see, but it's in you, what makes up your being your body, soul, and spirit. So your soul keeps on going. Your consciousness keeps on going. That's gonna to have to be covered. It's gonna to have to be right. It's gonna to have to be right with God. Because when your body dies, you have to give an account for your soul. That is, all the decisions that you make. And the biggest decision that you make is about salvation. And who's Lord of your life. And so if it's something that you haven't considered, if it's something that you don't care about, you're not concerned about, you need to get concerned about it. You need to care about it. In the same way you take care of your body or whatever, you need to take care of your soul. In fact, more importantly, you need to take care of your soul. The best way to take care of your soul is to repent and turn from sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the one that can regulate and maintain and sustain your soul. He wants complete charge of your soul. And what will happen is, when you believe Jesus, you turn from sin, the Holy Spirit will come into your life. Don't ask me how it happens, it just does. He comes into your life and he takes control of your soul. Gives you a brand new way of thinking and doing everything. Gives you a brand new consciousness. As a matter of fact, you become God conscious. 
and wanting to do the things of God and wanting to serve God. And that's how you're saved. You're saved by the sealing of the Holy Spirit in your life based on your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved. So you need to get saved right away, today, if possible, because you're not promised the rest of this day. You're not promised tomorrow. It could come to a point where your body, soul, and spirit is separate. That's the definition of death, whereby your spirit and your soul get separated from your body. At that point, you can't put it back in. And there's no guarantee you'll get it pumped back in. The only way you can go back in at that time or whatever is by the authority of God. You're not guaranteed that. Amen. Once your soul, spirit, and body are separate, that dissociation takes place, that's it. You're going to have to give an account for your soul. Amen. And involved in that is an account you're going to have to give for your sins. And if you didn't know Jesus as Lord and personal Savior, all the sin you were born in, Every single sin that you committed, you owe for it. And you don't have enough in your pension, your retirement, or what you've saved up, or what you leave behind to cover it. All those things are going to be left to somebody else to do whatever they're going to do with it. It's not going to hold any weight in judgment. It's not going to mean one bit of difference to God. You're going to have to have blood coverage. What God is looking for to pay the penalty for sin is whether or not you believe Jesus and whether or not his blood covers your life. That's the only thing that God's going to look for. And so to get that, you're going to have to change your mind today. Turn from your way. Turn from the world's way. Turn from sin and turn to Jesus and believe what he did on the cross for you. Over 2,000 years ago, I can tell you what he did. He died. God came to this earth in flesh form and gave the ultimate sacrifice that no man could do. He died on the cross as it was prophesied. He died, he shed his blood. Not only that, he rose again on the third day. He's living right now. He's in heaven right now. I can tell you what else has happened. There have been prophecies that have forecast not just his coming the first time, but they forecast his coming the second time. It's called the second coming. Amen. He's coming back soon and very soon. I don't have time to show you all the things that correlate with what you see today going on around you. And even over in the Middle East, it all lines right up completely with what was prophesied. as things that show forth the prelude to Jesus Christ's return. Yes, you ought to be afraid. Enough to give your life to Jesus today. Because you don't want to be caught with your work undone, particularly where your soul is concerned. Because Jesus is going to take his own. He's coming to build the kingdom, the government that established by his death and resurrection for his own. My question to you today, are you his own? Do you belong to him? You may have a mighty good family, very good job, very good group you're a part of, several things that you're connected with, but are you in the body of Christ? Listen, are you in the kingdom of God? You know the Lord Jesus Christ today. Well, if you don't get to know him, Repent, change your mind. If that's you and you're here, I want to talk to you after service. I want to see which way God is directing you and see what's on your mind. I want to hear from you. Wherever you might be watching from, make it a decision right now. Just say, I give my life to you, Lord, today. Right now, open my heart to you. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need forgiveness of sins. And I believe what you did on the cross over 2,000 years ago, and I believe it was for me. I accept it. I believe it. It's enough to get saved there. Just that simple. Or maybe you've drifted away. You know the Lord Jesus Christ, but you've done things your way. Uh, you've been disappointed. There have been some setbacks in your life. Truth be told, you might be angry with God. Well, get unangry with God. Realize that he's God and you're a servant. And he does things according to his will, in his time, in his way. And maybe your best days are ahead of you. Maybe all the things that you went after, the places that you went, were going to work together for good. Maybe it's all part of the school of hard knocks that you have to go through to get to where God is taking you. Stop everything right from where you are and come on back to fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if that's you, I'd like to talk to you after service. Let me pray for you right now. God, I just want to come in Jesus' name and thank you for just your authority and thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, and your justice. I pray, Lord, that you would hide us behind the cross who believe in you. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we have in your Holy Spirit. 
I pray that you would draw those that you have to be saved to you, to the cross, Father. Do whatever it takes in your permissive will to drive them to the end of themselves where they'll cry out to you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that they have. And Father, I just feel that for, pray for somebody today who might be on their sick bed, leading to becoming their deathbed, and they don't know you. Father, I pray that you would send somebody to minister the gospel of the kingdom to them. Pray, Lord, that you would send somebody just to speak the word of God to them, the gospel to them, the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there is nobody, I just pray, Father, that you would even possibly in, in a dream or vision, stop by their heart and speak to them right now, Lord, and bring the gospel to their life before they transition. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you for the bloodshed of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done and all you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 This time I'm going to give the benediction. Deacon's going to take charge off camera. We'll have a couple announcements very briefly to be ready to go from there. To stand and receive the benediction. And now may the God of all comfort and grace establish your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore, until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Mm-hmm.